So the Weierstrass approximation theorem basically says that if you have a continuous function, then it can be uniformly approximated by a sequence of polynomials. But there's no one way of doing that. I have actually made another video way in the past where we talked about the Bernstein approach to a Weierstrass approximation theorem, but there are many, many others. So I'm going to talk to you today about a proof out of Rudin's book, but as is typical with Rudin, he doesn't go enough in depth so you can really suss out all the little details and the, the real depth of his proof that is in here. But before we can really get into it, what I need to talk to you about first is uniform continuity and uniform convergence and also convolutions. Convolutions is one of these things that sort of sneak up on you in signal processing, Fourier analysis, algebra, regular analysis, all over the place. And this will allow us to talk about what are called delta sequences. And Rudin's proof not only solves the polynomial approximation problem, but it also solves a certain moment problem out of probability theory. It serves as a template for an approximate identity argument, which we have seen in the past used for inverting CT scanners data. And in the right light, uh, this theorem, the approach to this theorem, could even be seen as previewing some of the stuff that I do in my own research, which is called dynamic mode decomposition. But why don't we go ahead and get started. This is actually one of the most important theorems in all of real analysis. It, the ability to approximate any continuous function uniformly with a polynomial. And the reason why this is so important is that we leverage it over and over again for all sorts of estimation. But the truth is, that we can only evaluate polynomials because our computers and ourselves can only multiply and add a finite number of times and that more or less defines a polynomial. We can even come up with other strategies for estimating these things that aren't directly through polynomials like we can use Newton's method or all these other things but ultimately the computations of Newton's method are also polynomials. So if the Weierstrass theorem didn't hold if there were continuous functions that we could not approximate with polynomials, there would be more or less continuous functions that were computationally inaccessible to us. And so this really is an important theorem, and it's honestly my favorite theorem out of all the real analysis. So this is the Weierstrass theorem. It basically says that if we have a function that is continuous over some closed interval a, b to the complex numbers, then there is a sequence of polynomials that converges to f uniformly on this interval a, b. Now the first thing we're going to do here, just to make life simpler for us, is we're going to reduce this to being a function that not only is supported on not a, b, but is its domain is 0 to 1. Basically what we're going to do is we're going to get an approximation uh, on the 0 to 1 interval and then you sort of unwrap it into an approximation of f. And so I can show you how to do that really quick. We're going to say f and we're going to map it to f at b minus a x plus a. So our f of x function is now going to be uh, this function. And so so this it gives us a rescaling and shifting of our function. So, so now we went from having a function at a b to now we have a function at say 0 1. Right? And once we get an approximation over here, we can just undo this and shift it back and scale, rescale it back until we get this. And so that's fine. So we can uh, take the same function, say this f of say b minus a x plus a, and I'm going to subtract f of b minus f at a, and this times x uh, plus f at a. Okay, and so now what we're going to have then is if I put in x equals 0 on this term, I end up getting f of a. That's great. And when I put in x equals 1, I'm going to have uh, f of b minus f of a plus f of a, so that just gives me f of b. Now what happens then is if I put in 0 here, I'm going to get f of a on this side minus f of a, and so that gives me 0. And it, this is going to give me, uh, it, at x equals 1, f of b minus f of b, which is also 0. And so now I've basically taken f and I've turned it into a function that is just going to be 0 at 0 and 0 at 1. And if I, once I get a polynomial approximation that is uniformly approximating this, all I need to do is add this linear polynomial to that first polynomial approximation, and I get a polynomial approximation of this guy, and then I can rescale that guy back. So yeah, so those are the first two simplifications that we make here. 
Uniform convergence is really interesting. So there's a, a classical example of functions that don't converge uh, uniformly, and that is x to the n. So in this case, we have the function on the interval 0 to 1, and we have a sequence of polynomials, just power functions. And so it goes 1, x, x squared, x cubed, etc. And we know from calculus that if you just keep looking at power functions of higher and higher order, they're at the origin, they're going to get flatter and flatter and flatter. Well, this will continue until it fills out the entire 0, 1 interval. Except if you look at the point 1, all of the power functions are always 1 at 1. So we end up seeing that they end up getting steeper and steeper as the power of the power or function gets higher, and so it gets flatter and flatter at origin, but it eventually has to get up to that one. So if we look at that interval 0 to 1, we are converging to that interval going from 0 all the way up to 1 that is just going to be the 0 function except at 1, where it's going to be 1. And so that's an example where we don't have uniform convergence of polynomials. Now, one of the key ideas of uniform convergence is that if you have a uniformly convergent sequence of continuous functions, then the function they're converging to must also be continuous. And so this is an example where we can see that pointwise convergence doesn't necessarily lead to having a continuous function on the other side because this function isn't continuous, it has this jump discontinuity at 1. <clears throat> so a sequence of functions converge uniformly. In this case, our sequence of functions are going to be these pn's or our f convolved with qn. And so we say that this sequence converges to f uniformly on this closed interval a to b if for all epsilon greater than 0, there is one n that does not depend on x at all, such that for all the n's bigger than this little n, we end up having uh, these are going to be epsilon close. And so this hap and this same n works for all the x and a, b. And uh, we say a function is uniformly continuous, and so this is, this is about a bunch of sequences trying to converge to some other function. So you have some function that we have, you know, functions that are trying to converge to this guy. Um, but in this case, we have uh, uniform continuity, which basically says we're, we're trying to say that we can control how much wiggle there is between these two guys when you wiggle down here. And so ultimately, we say that for any epsilon greater than zero, there should be a, a delta that if any of these points are within delta of each other, then we know that this wiggle is never going to be more than, say, some specified epsilon. And that works, again, not locally at a particular x, but for all x and y, and that's what gives us this uniformity. So while I was editing this video, I bumped into a bunch of lecture notes by uh, Anton Shep. He goes over Weierstrass's proof of Weierstrass's approximation theorem, which apparently Weierstrass did when he was 70. Now, if you ever thought that you can be too old to do mathematics, Weierstrass is the perfect counterexample. I think he was like approaching his 40s when he actually got into mathematics. And then he came in and introduced a ton of counterexamples and gave us, you know, this one of the most celebrated theorems, this approximation theorem. I mean, and this stands in contrast to, uh, you know, what people like uh, Hardy would say, which is that mathematics is only a, a young man's game. And so the other half of your life should be spent writing textbooks, which is what Hardy did. But Weierstrass, uh, this isn't the route that he took. And so I, I think it's always really important to remember. All right, so now let's talk about uh, our function f now, which we have now restricted to being uh, a function on 0 to 1 that is 0 at 0 and 0 at 1. And what we're going to do then is we're going to extend it to all the real line. And we can do this continuously now because it does take those zeros at 0 and 1. And so we can just say uh, the rest of it, we're just going to define to be 0. And so this is an extension of f, and that way I can talk about convolutions properly. And you can do the same thing for, for qn of x. And so qn of x is 0 at negative 1 and at 1. We don't care about it being smooth there or not. It will be smoother and smoother as the powers get higher. But all I'm saying is that it, qn of x is just going to be defined to be 0 uh, outside of this negative 1 to 1 region. And when we do that, we can talk about convolutions. Now, a convolution is defined for, like, say, uh, we can take any other function, uh, say, g, that is compactly supported. This basically means it's going to be just like these other functions. It's going to be 0 outside of some closed interval. And then what I can do is I can define this. And so f convolved with g uh, turns into the integral from negative infinity to infinity, since everybody's now defined on negative infinity to infinity, of f of t times g of x minus t dt. And since f is only supported on, say, 0 to 1 and is 0 outside of that, uh, we can really just chop down this integral to just be the integral from 0 to 1 of f of t times g of 
x minus t dt. Uh, we can also take a look at this guy. So now this is what's actually going to be doing our approximation. This is doing all the hard work here. So we have f convolved with our qn of x. Now qn of x is our cn times 1 minus x squared raised to the nth power. And this convolution looks like this, just because we can chop, off, chop it off at 0 to 1. And ta-da, we have that. But uh, it might be more instructive to look at it like this. So you can go ahead and you flip this x and t around because it's an even function, so multiplying by negative 1 moves, makes it t minus x, and then you can shift things around until you get to here. Now keep track of the bounds, but you can uh, expand it up to 1 and negative 1 uh, without any real worry. As n goes to infinity, we're going to be emphasizing one particular piece of f of t minus x, and that is whatever happens at t equals 0, which is at f of x. And so f of x is going to be sort of carrying uh, the entire weight of everything. All right, so let's talk about Rudin's proof real quick. And there's one really key feature in all of this that makes it all work. And that is this function that he calls uh, q sub n. This q sub n is more or less innocuous. It is uh, 1 minus x squared to the nth power. And if you think about it, like 1 minus x squared is just a quadratic polynomial that's sort of upside down and with its vertex at, say, 0, 1. What you see is that if you look at it only at negative 1 to 1 and you increase its power, what's going to end up happening is it ends up being kind of peaky, where at the zeros at negative 1 to 1, it ends up getting flatter and flatter, and that one point stays the same. As we increase the power on 1 minus x squared, so we raise it to say 1 minus x squared squared, 1 minus x squared cubed, 1 minus x squared to the fourth, and etc. What we're going to see is that we're actually taking up less and less area underneath the curve. And so what Rudin does is he attaches this coefficient, the cn, and the cn is there to help normalize it. And what this normalization means is that if we take the integral from negative 1 to 1, of this function that we want this function to ultimately have area 1. And so as a consequence, what ends up happening as n goes to infinity, we end up having a very, very sharp spike at 0. And if you're thinking it sounds like delta function uh, or a delta sequence, then you'd be exactly right. That's exactly what he's doing here. Now, he kind of obscures a few things, and um, he doesn't actually write out his ultimate definition of what the polynomial approximation is going to be um, in terms of a convolution, which is really what it is. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this pn of x, and we're going to take a look and see what changes uh, when we look at this as a convolution. And ultimately what we're going to be doing is we're going to be emphasizing a single part of that f function, uh, depending on where we put that x. And that means that as n goes to infinity, we're going to have an area of 1 surrounding a very, very, very infinitesimal spot. And that infinitesimal spot will then concentrate all of the function value right there. And as long as it's a continuous function and doesn't move around too much, then ta-da, you win. And you get f of x. Uh, in the limit. But what you, but there's other bits that you have to do, and this is what brings it close to what is called an approximate identity argument. Well, you need to make sure that those other pieces that are going to zero are going to zero fast enough. And so there's a few estimations that uh, Rudin goes through to make sure that this ends up happening. And I'm going to take you through those in a second. His proof is pretty simple, and in fact, it's actually not too different than the proof that Weierstrass did. What Weierstrass did instead is he actually used a Gaussian function, which is a much more typical uh, delta function or delta sequence that you can do. So you basically you just look at it from negative infinity to infinity and it all concentrates it into that single point as you normalize it and make the variance smaller. What's different between this proof and the other is that this is much more direct. And so you get a polynomial straight out, out of the gate. What Weierstrass ended up having to do is he had to take the Gaussian function, expand it into his Taylor series, and then do it. So he had this like sort of multiple layers of approximation that gets kind of cumbersome. And so Rudin in his slick Rudin-esque way of doing things, I really just made it all in like one go. So it, it simplified the problem a lot. So this function is sort of the crux of everything. And what we're going to do is we have this 1 minus x squared raised to the nth power times some cn. And like I told you, the cn is there to make sure that we can keep this having uh, one area underneath the integral. So essentially, we are requiring the interval, interval from negative 1 to 1 of qn of x dx is equal to 1. So, so then what we can do in order to get this guy to be 
equal to one is we need to figure out what the CN is going to be. Well, we don't have to know exactly what CN is going to be, but what we would like to know is a bound on it. And so I've worked out this, this chain of inequalities, and this is the same thing that Rudin does. And essentially what we do is take a look at the integral from negative one to one of just this, this guy without the CN term. And this will give us an idea of how big it needs to be. And so what we do then is we take advantage of the even property of one minus x squared and turn this into two times the integral from zero to one of one minus x squared raised to the nth power. Now, this is identity is pretty easy. It just comes from having even functions. Now, going from this one to this one, this just is a little bit clever uh, because we just need to figure out what this is here, and it really just helps later on. So you'll see why this is important. It's just a clever idea that somebody had to make it work. Uh, and so essentially what we do is we change this integral of this positive thing, and we integrate over less of it. And so since everything is positive here, that guarantees that this is going to be smaller. And after this guy, we use a clever, uh, a clever inequality. And this is an inequality that comes up a lot when you're talking about, say, the binomial theorem. And so what we're going to end up doing is we're going to move this n over here next to x squared. And when we do that, we actually get something smaller. And so then once you have this, well, then you can go ahead and do this integral. I mean, this integral itself, it, the only complicated thing here is integrating x squared, which is not complicated at all. And so you run through the computations. That gets you uh, 4 thirds times 1 over the square root of n. You see this guy is coming up in here. And then uh, this ends up being bigger than 1 over the square root of n because 4 thirds is bigger than 1. And so what that tells us then is that if I were to take this square root of n and I move it over to here, you can say square root of n times integral from negative 1 to 1 of 1 minus x squared raised to the nth power dx, well, that is going to be bigger than 1. Uh, that, that's a strict inequality here. And so that tells us then that cn has to be less than or equal to square root of n, or, well, less than the square root of n. So we get this upper bound on here. And this, this upper bound on Cn is going to come in handy because later we're going to actually have to use it in order to show that we get convergence of those tails to zero, which is what I was talking to you about. And, if, and in fact, what we can show is that for any delta greater than equal to zero, uh, what we're going to end up having is that Qn of x, an absolute value, is going to be less than or equal to the square root of n times 1 minus delta squared raised to the nth power as long as the absolute value of x is bigger than delta and less than 1. And so what I'm ultimately saying here is that if you take a look at these guys, if I were to chop this off and say this is going to be de a delta, and so I'm going to say any point in between here and here, so any x in this area, when we look at qn at that x, it's going to end up being uh, bounded by this. And since delta is going to be, say, less than, we might as well keep it less than 1. Let's just 0 less than or equal to delta less than 1. What we're going to end up having is this ends up being less than 1. And so then this is something that's exponentially decreasing to 0. And so even though this is increasing to infinity, this is going to kill it. And so essentially what we're going to see is that this guy uniformly goes to zero on this interval. So it doesn't matter where we are in here. It's going to be, we can trap it underneath this guy that's going to sort of smash it down. So the tails are going to zero and it's going to be very important later. This is part of our, say, approximate identity argument. Uniform continuity is one of these really nice ideas that comes with compact sets. So the idea is that if we take a look at our function and we look at f of x and we take an epsilon greater than zero, we know that we can find some delta greater than zero so that the output doesn't move away from epsilon as long as we stay within delta of that x. But if we change the x's position, potentially that delta could get smaller, bigger, who knows? And so it won't necessarily be the same delta that we can use between, say, one point and the next. Uniform continuity says that there is a single delta that we can select might be a little bit larger, but it will work for all of the points in our domain. And it turns out that if you take a continuous function and you look at it over a compact set, it is automatically uniformly continuous. And this is one of the nice features between compactness and continuous functions. So we are looking at 
uh, f convolved with qn of x, and we're subtracting off f of x. These should be converging to each other. If this was actually converging to f, then that, that's a win. So let's go ahead and take a look at the distance between these two points. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to end up finding a bound that doesn't depend on x. And since it doesn't depend on x, that actually means that this is going to be a uniform convergence. And then after that, I'll show you that all of these actually have to be polynomials, and that that also solves a moment problem from probability. It's a simple moment problem, but it's really significant for something that really wasn't purported to have anything to do with it at all. Let's go ahead and take a look at it. So what's really neat is that I can actually change this to being, uh, well, let's go ahead and expand that definition. So we have the integral from negative 1 to 1 of f of x plus t times qn of t dt. And this other f is multiplied by 1, but we know that the integral from minus 1 to 1 of qn of t dt uh, is just 1. And so what's really neat then is I can actually just take uh, this guy, I can move it inside, and then we have this common factor of qn of t. And that's one of the big reasons why we want this to be 1, so we can do this silly little trick. What I get after putting everything together and factoring is I have the integral from minus 1 to 1 of f of x plus t minus f of x, and this guy in parentheses, times qn of t dt. All right? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to leverage uniform continuity of f since it is a continuous function over a compact interval of 0 to 1. And what I'm going to do then is I'm going to select epsilon to be greater than 0, and then I'm going to get my delta. We're going to let epsilon be greater than 0, and we're going to select delta greater than 0 such that we end up getting the distance between f of x minus f of y is going to be less than epsilon over 2 when the distance between x and y is less than delta. And this isn't the same x as that, so let's just say we can change this x to be, say, w, so we don't get confused. We know that f is uniformly continuous over a compact set, and a compact set is the interval 0 to 1. I need this delta in order to expand out the rest of uh, this proof here. So what I'm going to do then is first I'm going to move this absolute value bar inside, so then we end up splitting up this integral into three parts. And so we have, uh, say, the integral from minus delta to delta, and then we have the other pieces. The other pieces, we end up having this. So it's going to be plus the integral from, say, uh, negative 1 up to negative delta, and then we end up getting the integral from, say, delta to 1. We're going to use different inequalities to solve each one of these guys. So the first bit here is that we know that this guy is going to be smaller than twice the largest value that f takes on that interval. And so we'll call this term m is equal to the supremum of the absolute value of f of x on, for x being inside of, say, 0, 1. So continuous functions also take maximum values on compact sets. We haven't gone to that yet, but we will soon on my channel. And so we're just replace this with m. And so then what we end up getting is we have this can be replaced with 2m. And ditto over here. Replace both these guys by 2m. And we can replace qn by the inequality we found earlier. Now up here, this gets replaced by epsilon over 2. And so we end up having... Uh, 2m, I uh, actually make it 4m because we're having two contributions here, times the square root of n times 1 minus delta squared to the nth power. And then we have this next bit, which is going to be epsilon over 2, which is what we're replacing that here, uh, because we know all these terms are going to be within delta of x. And then what we can do is we can just replace this guy by the integral from minus 1 to 1 of qn of x dx, or t dt, and this guy is equal to 1. And so as n goes to infinity, uh, this is going to get to be underneath epsilon over 2 because it's constant. This grows like square root of n, and this decreases 0 exponentially. So for large enough n, this is less than epsilon over 2. So this becomes less than epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2, which, which is equal to epsilon. So what we did then is that we found for any epsilon greater than zero, uh, we can get an n large enough that for all n past a certain point, this is going to be less than epsilon. And then that basically means, uh, from our whole convergence theory of metric space and whatnot, that 
this guy converges to this guy pointwise. But notice that there is no dependence on x in any of these points here. Uh, this was the only place that we could have had dependence on x, uh, where if we put fix an x and we said uh, we're going to let it happen only when we're around x and consider only local uh, continuity ideas. But here, since we used uniform continuity, so no matter what this w is, this delta selection doesn't depend on that w. And so then that basically means that uh, we took care of the only bit that would have mattered to x, and we made it so it works for everybody. And so since it works for everybody, that means that this is actually a uniform bound that we get. That's a uniform n that will work for every single x. And so there you go. That is uniform convergence. But now I need to tell you how the heck this is a polynomial and how is this related to moment problems. So after coding up all the figures for this video, I realized that this is probably the worst a polynomial approximation algorithm that I've ever seen. I mean, it, if you go back to any of the interpolation videos I've done or the Bernstein polynomial approximation video, you'll see that they don't leave a gap as much as what this one does. And this algorithm, at the end of that figure, is, I, I think it's like a 360 degree polynomial. So it should be a, a nothing gap. We shouldn't be able to see it. Uh, despite how historically interesting this proof is and how close it is to the Wireshaw's proof, uh, it still isn't a, a very good algorithm to use. So if you wanted the code from any of the figures in the video, I usually put the code in the, the video description. So you'll find a link to a Bitbucket and you can just download the code itself if you want to play with it in MATLAB. Anyway, so let's get back to the proof. As Rudin usually does, uh, he hand waves this whole argument. He says it's clearly a polynomial because of all this happening. And so let me work that out for you and show you exactly why this is a polynomial. And what's really interesting is that the data that we get from f, that we see that we need from f, is actually exactly what you need for a moment problem. And so what we're essentially going to be showing is that at the end of the day, we are actually going to be uh, solving a particular subclass of moment problems by using this convolution trick. Now, now if we're now QN, what you can see is that I can actually go ahead and expand this out with the binomial theorem, which is by no means a nice thing to do, but it is something we know we can do. We're just going to have a lot of summations here. Okay, so we've gone one step further, but we aren't there yet. Uh, we still need to expand this guy in terms of the binomial theorem. And so this is where it gets really interesting. So if you know anything about uh, measure theory or moment problems, and this comes up in physics, and it comes up in statistics, and a whole bunch of other places. And so these are called the moments, and then the problem, the inverse problem, or the moment problem, basically says, can you take these guys, and can you get back F? And so what we're do saying here is that not only does this guy give us a polynomial, and by the way, this is a polynomial because this is just constant and we just have a whole bunch of linear combinations of powers of x, so polynomial, ta-da. Um, but the data we get, these are all moments. And I found that really fascinating when I bumped into that. And so this actually resolves not only this polynomial approximation problem, which in itself is an inverse problem of some kind, uh, but the data that this one uses comes directly from moments. And so as long as you have a function that is continuous on, say, a to b, then this will end up giving you an approximation. Uh, of course, with the caveat that, we, remember, we have rescaled this to being on 0 to 1, and is 0 at 0 and 1 at 1. So I thought that was really interesting. And so I want to walk you through that, because it's something that's really subtle inside of Rudin's principles of mathematical analysis that he doesn't really mention at all. He just sort of continues on. And I thought this was a remarkable result and uh, it gets you something a little bit unexpected. Okay, so that's that. And I want to thank you for sticking through this video and well, making it to the end. So that is the Weierstrass theorem. It's my favorite theorem out of all of real analysis. And there's so many neat ways of approaching this problem, and I, I thought that Rudin's approach to this was really, really slick. So in any case, thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great day.